Hey, what's up? It's Triggy. Frugal Science is recreating essential medical or laboratory tools at a very low cost so that more people around the world have access to them. A classic example is the paper centrifuge. A centrifuge typically costs thousands of dollars. This frugal version costs less than a dollar and can separate blood from plasma in less than 90 seconds and is used to quickly and cheaply diagnose malaria. Frugal Science strikes me as a terrific way to put engineering to use in an impactful way. So when I saw this device selling for $18,000, I was like, I'm pretty sure I can make that for literally 100 times cheaper. So what is it? It's a multi-channel pipette. You remember pipettes from chemistry? It's the same thing, but a hundred of them at the same time. If you're testing hundreds of patient samples for a virus or screening hundreds of compounds for a new drug, doing it one pipette at a time takes a lot of time. And for those awaiting a diagnosis or the development of a new treatment, time isn't money, it's lives. I wanted to add another challenge to this build. I want it to be reproducible. So that means sticking to standard, off-the-shelf components that can be bought in bulk. In this case, I've limited myself to just two processes, 3D printing and laser cutting. Now, laser cutting might sound like a big deal, but there are tons of services who will deliver it for a low price. Okay, let's talk about the design. I need to be able to suck up and dispense liquid, I guess with some kind of tube. The chemistry trays are 8x12, so I have to do this 96 times identically. Having 96 separate actuators is not realistic, so I want to tie all of these together. I could have one pump that is connected to all 96 tubes, but getting all of the conditions to be identical for the suction to divide perfectly 96 times is just not going to happen. So I'm thinking a plunger to move liquid in and out. Each tube has its own plunger, and I connect all of the plungers to a plate, so we can move them all at once by moving the plate up and down. It also needs to move in perfect parallel so that all the plungers move at the same rate. For this, I'm taking inspiration from 3D printers and will move the plate up and down with NEMA motors and threaded rods. The motor spins the rod, which is connected to a nut. If the nut is held so that it can't just spin, it's forced to move up. And since 3D printers pretty much all use these, they're ubiquitous and quite cheap. In order to move the plate up evenly, I'll need at least three motors. I'll use four for assurance and symmetry. When I connect the motors and nuts to these two plates, you see the top plate raises and lowers parallel to the bottom one. Okay, let's talk about this plunger design. At first I was thinking a rod threaded on one side so it could be attached to a plate with an o-ring so that there's a good seal. The only problem is that in order to get a good seal, the o-ring fit needs to be tight, which is causing a lot of friction, even with lube. Is there a product that has a perfect seal, doesn't contaminate, and is easy to source? Yes, of course syringes are the ideal solution here. The grips on the end of the syringe are larger than the spacing on the multi-well, meaning they have to be removed by hand. I can use the tip of the commercial plunger and attach that to some threaded rod with a 3D printed part. I've put a few plungers and barrels onto the plates, and we can see the plunging mechanism so far working as I'd hoped, which is very exciting to see. Somehow, this whole contraption needs to be raised and lowered to make space for the multi-well. The commercial option uses linear rails and a screw clamp to raise and lower the multi-well, which I don't love, and I'd prefer that the pipettes move rather than that the multi-well move. I'm thinking a lever connected to some linkages that generate some linear motion. If I connect the lever to another link with gears, then they'll have an equal and opposite motion. I can duplicate that onto the other side, and then we have identical motion at all four corners. Connecting each of these to a corner of the plate allows it to move up and down. Gears are so satisfying when everything meshes correctly. We get mirrored motion in the linkages with negligible backlash. Now I just need to duplicate this motion onto a second set of linkages. To do that, I'm attaching the steel extrude with an interference fit into the 3D printed holders. And look at that, it looks and functions exactly like the model. Which, I mean, I guess, of course it does, but it's still extremely satisfying. The major mechanisms are complete, though currently they're just floating in space. I'm going to make a housing from 2020 aluminum extrude. This stuff was extremely cheap. I suppose again because they're used for 3D printing, but also because the lengths I'm using are quite small. This aluminum extrude is a lot of fun. I can use these T-nuts which lock in place inside the grooves of the extrude. This lets me add kind of anything, anywhere, such as these brackets. A few of these are all I need to make the basic housing. Then I can install the lever mechanism with more T-nuts. The motorized plunger plates are going to need to slide up and down, and for that I'll be using these linear rails. 
Each rail has two slides, one for each plate. Having two slides means not only will the plates be able to slide relative to the ground, but also relative to each other. When I attach all of them, we see all of the lower slides are forced to move identically. Here we can see the bottom plate moves up and down with the lever. The second plate is free to move relative to the first plate, and both plates can be moved together. Time to find a good way to hold these plunger barrels in place. My original plan was to use CA glue or epoxy, but the polypropylene plastic used for syringes is used specifically because it doesn't react chemically to much, and most adhesives don't work. So I need to change my approach here, and I'll try clamping them in place. This piece will hold the barrel loosely, and the second piece will tighten down on top of it. This gives excellent grip, and the clamp can be bolted to make it even more secure. But while this was a cool idea, it didn't scale. In order to pull it tight, I needed to first insert a long bolt into each nut, then repeatedly give each a half turn to tighten them evenly. This not only took absolutely forever, but the forces were causing the plate to warp, and I needed a better idea. I swapped the clamp for a press fit solution. I printed tubes for the barrels to fit snugly into. This provided more than enough grip to keep the barrel from moving with the force of the plunger, especially once I tapped them into place with a hammer. Speaking of issues with scaling, I laboriously built and installed 96 threaded rod plungers. I already started doubting the solution once it became clear how long this process was, and then there was another problem. Tiny misalignments caused the rigid plungers to press against the side of the barrel, creating tons of friction. So it's a bummer that all that time was for nothing, but I'm actually pretty glad to scrap this cumbersome design. Instead, I'm going to use the original syringe barrels. The reason I didn't start with this was because the spacing of the syringes needs to be 9mm, and infuriatingly, the plungers have a diameter of 9.5mm, so they can't sit flush. However, chucking the plunger into a drill and sanding it down takes very little time. I can sand them down to 8mm, and they sit flush without overlapping. I can do this for all the plungers, and then they can be installed. Remember when I had no plan for the electronics? There's sort of a plan now, insofar as I will put all of the electronics in a box and put that box onto the housing. I'll keep the user interface minimal and intuitive, since all this thing is doing is sucking and ejecting different amounts. Speaking of which, not a bad time to find a better word than suck for the interface. It looks like industry standard is aspirate and dispense, so I'll go with that. And I'll just append the limit switches into the design here, so the plates can calibrate their position. Also, the laser cut parts arrived, so I can replace all of the appropriate pieces with steel. I spent a lot of time thinking about how to get the pipette tips to fit onto the ends of the syringes with a good seal. I'll spare you the many failed designs and tests, and I ended up with this simple and effective solution of adding heat shrink tubing to the tips of the syringes to have their outer diameters match the inner diameters of the pipette tips. The tips get delivered pre-arranged in these boxes, and with some finagling they can be loaded into the machine in one go. With those details complete, we can put this device to the test. First, a basic test. I'll aspirate 150 microliters and then dispense 50 microliters three times. Everything appears to be working, which is very exciting to see. Now I want to test with the multi-well. I'll just dispense 30 microliters into each. The result looks really good with even amounts in each. I want to measure this a bit more precisely, but I only have a kitchen scale right now, which doesn't measure less than a gram, so the best I could think of was to measure each row and make sure they were even. I did four rows with one paper towel and four with another, and then also checked that their final weights also matched. I did the same with the columns and got consistent results across the board. This obviously isn't perfect, but it's a good first indication. Alright, now let's have some fun with this. I'll fill each row with a different concentration of Reagent 1, and each column with a different concentration of Reagent 2. These are just watercolors, and you can see here that the color doesn't completely diffuse, which ends up affecting the outcome a little bit, but it's not a big deal. I'll add the first to the multi-well, and now the second. This should result in a different color combination in each of our 96 wells. The result looks spectacular. Now we'll do the same with red and blue. We can imagine each row is, for example, a different solvent, and each row a different compound. This lets a scientist test each of the 96 different combinations of chemicals in a single process. 
and just as before, we get a beautiful result. So did this achieve the goal of making something useful for cheap? Cheap, certainly. Even with me buying parts in small quantities, everything together came out to like 250 bucks, and buying everything in bulk would reduce that a lot. Now this isn't going to replace high-end lab equipment, and that's not the point. The point is to reduce barrier to entry for these tools. So let me know what you think. If you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.